I'm uh, here today to introduce Simon Franklin, but before I do so, let me introduce myself. I'm Valerie Kivelson. I'm standing in for Doug Northrup today and uh, attempting uh, futilely to match his elegance of <laughs> introduction. Uh, also, before I, I do my actual introduction, I wanted to announce that I think the last Crease Brown Bag of the year is taking place a week from today in this room, uh, noon to 1.30, Reflections on Two Decades of Water Cooperation and Conflict in Post-Soviet Central Asia. Uh, Erica Weinthal, Associate Professor of Environmental Policy from Duke, will be giving that lecture in uh, conjunction with the LSA theme semester on water. Our visitor today uh, is, is someone who we're absolutely delighted to welcome to Ann Arbor, his first trip to Ann Arbor. Uh, this is Simon Franklin, professor of Slavonic studies at the University of Cambridge and head of school, which he kindly translates into American as dean. Uh, of Arts and Humanities at the University of Cambridge. Um, Professor Franklin is someone whose work I had read uh, with absolute delight for many years uh, before actually meeting him maybe five years ago. Uh, his work is always surprising, always asks questions that one had never thought to ask and answers them in creative and wonderfully surprising ways. For, for many years, we've, we've been confronting the question posed by the School of, of Subaltern Studies, can the subaltern speak? Uh, Professor Franklin poses a different set of questions. Can a blot of wax on a piece of paper speak? <laughs> Can a few scratches on the wall of a church in Kiev speak? Um, can the cryptic writing on a piece of Novgorodian birch bark speak? In his hands, these uh, otherwise silent and unhelpful commentaries turn into lenses for looking at medieval societies in completely new ways. Uh, his publications range widely from a book on this subject of, of turning the, the uh, sparse commentary left by medieval Rus into a rich understanding of that world. Uh, came out in a, a wonderful book. Um, I've got the 2010 date. Oh, here, 2002, Writing Society and Culture in Early Rus. 900, 950 to 1300, uh, which has recently appeared in a Russian translation, uh, as well as the, the most exciting and uh, eye-opening textbook survey of medieval Rus, the emergence of Rus 750 to 1200, co-authored with Jonathan Shepard, which appeared in 1996, uh, and more recently uh, with Emma Wittes, uh, a really interesting and rich collection of articles, National Identity in Russian Culture and Introduction, 2004. These are just a few of the, the highlights of a, a very bright CV here. Um, publications range at, from these early medieval Russian texts to the poetry of Anna Akhmatova, uh, an introduction to the master in Margarita, and so on. So um, I won't. I won't make any attempt to to uh, convey this in full, but it's a rich and and wonderful uh, collection of publications. Today, um, Professor Franklin is speaking to us on a broader vision of the meaning of writing and the word in Russian culture, which he takes from the medieval farther on in time. And so I turn the floor over to him with displaying the world word in Russian culture. Thank you. Display rather than displaying and the difference will, will, will become clear later. Um, I start with 
Two apologies. One uh, for the fact that it's impossible for me to actually live up to that introduction. Um, the second that, that uh, if anyone was at one or two were at the workshop we did yesterday, which I hugely enjoyed, there is some overlap between one section of this and some of the things we were talking about yesterday, but there are more illustrations today. Um, and uh, the main paper I have to start with with a confession, which is that the title of this of this talk is not my own invention. It, it started as an assignment uh, set me by my colleagues, Emma Widdis and Polly Blakesley in Cambridge, for a series of lectures they were organizing under the general title Display in Russian Culture, um, a theme which also has obvious affinities with the excellent book on picturing Russia, uh, devised by Val Kivelson and, and Joan Neuberger. Um, the title of the assignment Display of the Word sounded simple enough, and what you see does, has, has developed some way from, from, from there, but then you sit down in front of a, a blank screen or blank piece of paper and, and, and um, what does it mean? It hits you. Um, display of the word. What, what word? Um, Russian has lots of words. Uh, what, one can sensibly, what can one sensibly say about their display in Russian culture, the whole of Russian culture? They're all over the place, from billboards to blogs, from museums to menus, from sweet wrappers to, to street signs. What am I supposed to be talking about? Am I supposed to be talking about that kind of thing? There's a couple of postcards there clearly displaying words uh, or, 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 or that, um, which is uh, actually that 17th century, just in case people thought it was modern to, to weave words into, into curious shapes. Um, so, so calligraphy or, or that, which is 20th century um, typefaces of various kinds. This is clearly art on the left. Actually, on, on the right there is, is a sample of typefaces produced for, for, for Pravda uh, at the beginning of the 1930s, um, but it could equally well pass for um, experiments in typography. Uh, how does one locate anything that's specifically Russian? How can one give an overview which isn't merely trite? How can one give examples which, however interesting in themselves, are not merely random? The task in these terms is, is clearly impossible. Uh, one traditional solution, of course, is if, if one doesn't like the way things seem to be heading, with the obvious meanings of the title, try some non-obvious meanings, play around with the terms of, of reference. And uh, so if I were to choose to be perverse, I might, for example, start off with something like that. Uh, that's a church, actually. It's, it's the church of the Domitian in, in Vladimir could be any other church, it's generic, not individual, but where are the words? How is that the display of the words? Well, one could respond, why should a talk on display of the word be expected merely to focus on words as lexical units represented by sequences of letters in an alphabet? What a limited vision. I take orthography seriously. The word in the title has a capital letter. Uh, perhaps the capital implies that the subject is not just words in general, but the word, specifically with the capital W, the divine word. Virtually all high-level visual culture in Rus and Russia for the first seven centuries was devoted to display of the word in, in that sense, or, or rather in at least two senses, and I'll develop this just a little bit. The first sense is, is theological. The lesson of the incarnation of God becoming man is that the divine was made tangible, visible, and to create a visible likeness of the divine is not merely an aesthetic pursuit, that is art, uh, but a devotional obligation. The theology of the icon requires the display of the word, the divine, from figures of Christ to the microcosm of sacred space, which is the church building itself. The church is the visible representation in that sense of, of the word. Uh, the second sense in which this might be the case, uh, in which the church or the space of the church and the objects within it represent display of the word is more mundane, relating not to theology, but to narrative. Inside our generic church, there are, there are pictures, lots of them, in many different sizes, created by many different techniques, monumental pictures on walls, tiny pictures in books, pictures painted on wood, pictures cast in metal, woven in cloth, carved in bone. These pictures we're not supposed to be imaginary scenes or people. Narrative pictures are justified by texts. They are illustrations, whether in the scenes of hagiographical icons, episodes from a saint's life, or the grand programs of a fresco uh, or mosaic decoration, which follow episodes from the Old and New Testament and Apocrypha. Words lie behind the pictures. 
The pictures are the figural translation, the projection, the display of words. This isn't just an extrapolation from their contents. In various forms, in many countries, it's been part of the explicit justification for religious painting. One of the earliest uh, classic formulations, in fact produced by a Western churchman, Pope Gregory the Great, against the charge that the veneration of pictures can be dangerously close to idolatry, uh, is precisely on these grounds. He says, what writing offers to those who read, a picture offers to the ignorant who look at it. In it, those who don't know letters read. In this view, religious pictures are letters for the unlettered. They are texts, not merely in the modern sense that all cultural production can be viewed as a text, but they have direct relation to verbal texts as their functional visual equivalent. They are the display of words for those who can't read words themselves. So, that's one path I might explore if I were to indulge in willful distortion of the title, but I won't. Um, but I might just mention another possibility for the creative misinterpretation of the terms of reference. Um, I've looked at one component of the title, display of, of, of the word. What about the other, uh, display? What do we want display to mean? In a rather quaint way, I still tend to refer such questions to the Oxford English Dictionary rather than Wikipedia. Uh, and I find <laughs> that the first definition uh, associates display with performing or, or showing. In this definition, a word is displayed when its visual aspect is in some way, in some marked way, performative or demonstrative rather than just verbally communicative. In cultural history, we always have a choice whether to impose our own categories and vocabulary on the culture we're studying or whether to try to think ourselves into the terms and categories within that culture. Why should I impose an English dictionary definition on display? What does display mean in Russian culture? Display is a Russian word, of course. It's been in use since the 1970s. As far as I'm aware, display first enters Russian lexicography in the 1982 Dictionary of Foreign Words, since when it's been absorbed into the major Academy of Science dictionaries. It means specifically this, a monitor, a screen display. This, as it happens, is the second definition in the Oxford English Dictionary, an electronic device for the visual presentation of data or images. In trying to understand the past or another culture, we're not obliged to limit ourselves to the terms in which the past or the relevant culture explains itself, uh, but a bit of lexic lexicographical empathy is, is helpful nevertheless. So if my talk is to be about the word in display, it would be far more compact chronologically and I could concentrate on the past 30 years or so. Certainly it is display in this sense which has made the biggest difference to display over that period, not just visually in terms of specific design and presentation, but in the very nature of the word as object. Before the age of display, production decisions about display, I'll stop playing this game in a moment, were among the key factors which determined the verbal artifact as a made object. When the means of production are physical, whether in manuscript, print, carved relief, painting, enamel, in casting, or whatever, the text is inseparable from the means by which it was produced. The word is made flesh, so to speak. Display is fixed in production, and the word as object is then the same for all who use it. Display is fundamentally different. Not only, does it it, not only does it enable all of us to become producers and instant distributors worldwide, not only does it transform the processes and possibilities of design, not only does it enable producers to revise the visual presentation in a thousand ways at any time during the production and after the production of the text, but by enabling all receivers or consumers of the text to do the same, through reformatting, it breaks the two and a half thousand year old assumption of fixed display as a defining feature of the made 
text. When we send words out into the world, we have no assurance that the way we choose to display it will remain the same way or any or all, on any or all of a million other people's display. It is almost as if we're back in an oral environment in which every receiver is also a producer who can re-articulate the message at will. No longer is the display of the word a given defined by a remote producer. It can be whatever anybody wants it to be. Within, that is, the limit set out by the program available on the relevant display. So, my title and display of the word could be from the word to display. Or indeed, if one were in punning mode and bearing in mind Microsoft's near ubiquitous presence in display, one could define the title as from the word to word. <laughs> and if I were to take that framework seriously, I would have to note that there's something missing. The church provided the institutional, ideological, and material base for most verbal display throughout the pre-modern period, that is, in Russia until at least the end of the 17th century. Display is utterly contemporary, if not in all senses postmodern. What's in between? The church and display are instructively asymmetrical. The church is a public display space, but enclosed. The desktop screen is a private space, yet in a way far more open, enabling instant dissemination worldwide to millions of other enclosed private display spaces. There's an obvious gap, chronological, spatial, and sociocultural. And the emblem of that missing element is this, the city. Like the pictures of the church and the screen display, uh, this picture shows no visible words. That is Moscow, um, for those who don't instantly recognize it. Um, but it doesn't matter that it happens to be Moscow. Uh, as on the two, in the two other instances, I want for the moment to focus attention on the context, not to distract attention towards any particular words on display. And the missing context is, is the city, a cityscape. Display of the word takes place not just in a changing cultural or technological environment. It takes place in a changing graphic environment. The church and the desktop display represent quite dense graphic environments, but enclosed. In the case of the church, this is not exclusively because it was a pre-modern environment. There's no rule which says that pre-modern societies keep their verbal displays indoors. A walk through ancient Athens would have taken you past plenty of inscribed stones and monuments. Medieval Scandinavia has its rune stones. Early Rus does not. Public verbal display was, was possible, that's a um, pretty monumental uh, 12th century inscription, but very rare. Even in restricted open spaces such as cemeteries, inscribed gravestones don't become habitual in Russia before the 16th and 17th centuries. The major thickening out of the graphic environment in Russia's open public spaces begins in the late 18th century, but gathers pace over the 19th and into the 20th centuries, starting with inscriptions on monuments um, the Bronze Horseman in St. Petersburg. Note these railings, which are actually part of the... Um, we, we don't see them now. They're part of the original design. Um, they were there from 1781 to 1903. So Falconet's famous monument to Peter the Great in St. Petersburg, or just over a century later, the Pushkin Monument in, in, in Moscow. These are emblematic. Um, we can breathe easier, talk on Russian culture, mention Pushkin, we've, we've, we've touched the, 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 the sacred spaces, we're all right. Um, the rest is, is blessed as it should be. Uh, buildings become billboards as display writing colonizes the city streets, not just in Moscow and St. Petersburg. We've got um, Kuznetsky Most and Nevsky Prospect, and you can begin to see words as display all over the place in commercial Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, but in the provinces as well, there's on the top there, um, uh, Tambov, um, early Soviet Vologda, love that shop sign for a collect shop of collect collectibles you buy in that shop. Um, until we reach the kind of ordinary diversity of any urban spaces one sees today, the graphic environment that's familiar in any 
town of open spaces. That one happens to be in Bisk in central Siberia, and that happens to be in Moscow, but uh, one wouldn't necessarily know, so to speak. That's a, that's a chic art gallery, and this is the local museum. So, by avoiding the subject, um, we have, as it turns out, managed to take a kind of preliminary walk around the subject. By indulgence in the rather hackneyed rhetorical device of praetoritio, that is, by, that is mentioning things by saying one's not going to mention them, we've arrived at a kind of overview, a sort of basic framework. If we were to con construct a more extensive survey of verbal display in Russia, we might well choose to arrange it in terms of this sequence of emblems. <coughs> Despite the fact that they were initially produced as a means of avoiding the task implied by the assignment title. This is a somewhat fortuitous overview, uh, but from here I think we can proceed to some case studies. And I'm going to produce just two of them. There is no point in trying to be comprehensive. The comprehensiveness is in this overview. Uh, but in an attempt to avoid randomness, I will focus not just on individual examples, but on types of display, modes of display, which uh, I think have some deep structural significance for Russian culture. They involve huge quantities of objects over very long periods of time. Uh, in my first example, we go right back to the beginning. I can't leave the church alone. Let's go inside it and look at the pictures. I mentioned two senses in which the church might be understood as displaying the word. Uh, the iconic sense as a representation of the word and in an illustrative sense containing pictures which are projections of and at some level substitutes for verbal texts. But there's a third aspect to this, more directly relevant to the obvious meaning of the title of this talk. The pictures are conspicuously verbose. They display actual words, not just behind the picture, but words in and as part of the picture. Lots of them. This applies across media and across centuries, from panel icons on wood, that's a very early representation of, of, of the cross, and you can see lots of, I, I don't know if there's a pointer here, but anyway, you can, you can see lots of, lots of captions and words up there. It doesn't matter particularly at the moment what they say, um, but just illustrating the range and, and the media. Um, panel icons on wood, like this very er early representation of the cross with written labels for cherubim and seraphim and the archangels Michael and Gabriel, and even the sun and the moon. Or uh, these manuscript miniatures, uh, one from the 11th century on the left, that's from the Ostromir Gospel, which is the earliest dative, dated Slavonic manuscript, uh, and the other is an 18th century manuscript um, on the right. Uh, or these images from uh, the 13th century, one a stone relief from Novgorod, the other a gold encrusted panel door from Suzdal. So this is multimedia. Um, there's a, a distortion in this mode of display because this represents everything as the same size. Uh, and that is not the case. Some things here are uh, more or less natural size, others you'd be, you'd be very hard to... They're tiny. Um, uh, or these um, elaborately carved bone icons, all of, all of that, and up at the top there, it's all, it's all writing. Uh, or this 21st century depiction of the last Tsar, Nicholas II, and his family, uh, telling us who they are. Uh, Or this going right, the back, right back to the beginning, this monumental mosaic in the most magnificent of the surviving early Rus churches, St. Sophia in Kiev. Everywhere, in all ages, the pictorial display within orthodoxy is remarkable for its wordiness. Two questions. What do the words say and what do the words mean? These, as we'll see, don't necessarily amount to the same thing. If you'd ask most of the congregation of, or visitors to this particular church throughout its 950 years what most of the words say, they probably wouldn't have been able to tell you. And this isn't just because much of the congregation for many of these centuries would have been unable to read. 
even the literate, ancient and modern, would have had difficulty. Why? Because the inscriptions are not in Russian, or in Ukrainian, or indeed in any variety of Slavonic. They're in Greek. This picture, for example, gives words spoken by Christ to his disciples as reenacted by the priest at the service. Take, eat, for the remission of, remission of sins, and so on. So why, why does Christ here, and indeed all the figures in all of the St. Sophia mosaics, talk Greek? because this picture was made by craftsmen from the Greek-speaking world. The early Rus had quite recently adopted East Roman Byzantine Christianity, and their visible Christian culture was constructed according to Byzantine models, initially through importing Byzantine specialists to do the job. This is therefore, in effect, a Greek church, the centerpiece of the kind of Constantinople on Dnieper, which was early Kiev. But the Greek was not just imposed, it was also the choice of, or presumably at least acceptable to, those in Kiev who paid very good money for what was the largest and grandest church in the East Slav lands for the next four centuries. More than a verbal message, the displays of Greek were a cultural declaration. Displays of Greek and Greekness were modish at the time, badges of cultural affiliation. Within a generation or two, in most contexts, the Greek had been replaced by Slavonic. So, why dwell on it if it was just a transient episode, if it was just an ephemeral fashion statement nearly a thousand years ago? Well, it's not quite as simple as that. Greekness doesn't disappear quite so straightforwardly as I've implied, and its survivals have important connotations for understanding of the functions of verbal display in these contexts. Played words can be split into two types, messages and captions. Messages either describe the scene or explain part of its dynamics. Thus, for example, the words along the base of the Eucharist mosaic in St. Sophia display the words spoken by Christ to his disciples in the scene depicted. A detail from the Last Judgment in a church just outside Novgorod on your left shows a kind of speech bubble, rather like a comic strip. The demon tells the rich man in hell, rich friend, drink some burning flame. A miniature in a late 18th century, old believer, apocalyptic manuscript. They, they were nice to each other in those days. Um, 18th century old believer, apocalyptic manuscript explains that the righteous will be born up on clouds and that a river of fire will resound with fearsome thunder. These types of messages do imply or assume a potentially literate viewer able to read the display as verbal text. Among the other types of descriptions, however, the labels, this is not always so. Let's go back to the apse mosaic in St. Sophia. The letters prominent on either side of the Mother of God's head are not Greek words, but Greek abbreviations, short for metertheu, the Mother of God. Unlike the wordier texts, which soon switch to Slavonic, this caption does not change. It survives not just a little longer, but for centuries. Whether on this late medieval panel icon, you can see up in the top left-hand corner the same abbreviation, uh, or on your right on the rather quaintly, crudely painted, uh, crudely printed icon, uh, pasted into the front of a 19th century manuscript book with a Slavonic descriptive label, but still with the Greek abbreviation on either side of the Mother of God's head. Or this 17th century uh, wood carved icon, again the same abbreviations uh, everywhere. The Mother of God Greek display is probably the most prominent and consistent, but is not unique. Look at the writing on the top of this, an early uh, mosaic monumental decoration of St. Demetrius, the A inside an O, in fact a Greek alpha inside a Greek omicron, another abbreviation short for oagios meaning saint. Again, the graphic convention survives Slavonization, as on this slide of that's the, the famous Novgorod icon of St. George, and you can see um, the abbreviation uh, more clearly in the slide on your, 
on your right, or look at the letters inside Christ's halo in this panel icon with the close-up there. Um, more Greek, uh, hot on meaning the one, the being, he who is, and again it crops up in many media and centuries, as in this slide, uh, 17th century uh, silver chalice, or in this 14th century fresco, or indeed 18th century manuscript miniature, if you look inside Christ's halo. So, what do these displays mean? Nobody can imagine that all these Greek abbreviations were produced by Greeks, or that all or any of their viewers understood Greek. The answer, of course, is that as a graphic communicative device, this had long ceased to be abbreviated Greek. Originally Greek, for understandable context-specific historical reasons, these quickly ceased to be words to be read, a verbal message. They became signs to be understood outside any particular language. They are necessary parts of the picture as identifying, authenticating marks. They bear a resemblance to letters, but they function as ideograms. If we were to pursue crude analogy to the point of bad taste, we might compare them to brand markers or logos. The extraordinary tenacity of these emblematic representations of words provide a particularly graphic, in all senses, reminder that the writing of meaning is only one aspect of the meaning of writing. That's a bit trite. Um, but we can go further. The ex-Greek emblems are strong examples of verbal display as non-verbal sign. But to some degree, the same function is fulfilled by almost any of the words in these types of pictures. The mere fact of verbal display is emblematic, regardless of language. The presence of words on religious images was more than just a characteristic feature. It became a distinguishing feature. Christian imagery displayed words. Non-Christian imagery did not display words. Even in the earliest period, we find non-ecclesiastical imagery, such as these figures of dancers, musicians, mythical birds on silver and um, yellow bracelets. And yellow, I've written here nylon, I've no idea why. Um, and not displayed, not a displayed word in sight. Or perhaps more eloquent in its way, because from within a culture of words, if we look at this illustrated chronicle, the pictures are surrounded by words. This is 16th century. But this is secular narrative, not religious imagery, and the words are all outside the pictures. There are no labels within the pictures themselves. The display of words on an image was itself a distinguishing feature. It marked the image as specifically Christian. It, too, was an emblem of the cultural context and the status of the object. Perhaps we can carry the implications of this even further. The emergence of a secular elite culture of visual representation is associated with the late 17th and early 18th centuries. And I'm on very dangerous ground here with people who actually know what they'd be talking about in this area, which I, I don't. This was a westernizing process in the visual as in many other spheres. In Western painting, there were various conventions of captioning and labeling of pictures inside or outside the frame. In Russia, after some initial wavering among the many signs of differentiation between the secular and the sacred in portrait representation, between religion and art, if you will, was precisely the display or the lack of display of words within the frame as part of the picture. Icons need words, art portraits did not. We can follow the process. These are two portraits of Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich, both dating from the early 1670s. The one on the left is, is Russian from a manuscript. The one on the right, a Western engraving. The iconic affiliations of the Russian portrait have often been enumerated, but rarely in relation to the display of the words. In the Russian icon type portrait, the label is inside the depicted frame. On the Western portrait, Though they are in the picture as a whole, the words are outside, or rather on, the depicted frame. The move from icons to art 
shifts the verbal display of captions out of the picture, so to speak, onto the outside, outs, onto or outside the frame except signatures. Soon, by the early 18th century, we're on to ordinary wordless art portraiture, such as this, or this, or, oh, um, what's happened there? Something not quite right. There's, there's a portrait with um, an art picture with a caption within the frame. How, how embarrassing. Um, or, or, or perhaps not. This is deliberately not presented as a normal art portrait. The portrait is one of a series comprising members of Peter the Great's most drunken synod. Uh, a kind of mock religious fraternity. The portrait, too, is in part ironic, parodic, a kind of mock icon. The mode of display writing is a marker of its mock iconicity. It is meant to look incongruous <coughs> in a non-iconic portrait. That's the point of it. The apparent exception is therefore a striking confirmation of the rule. It's demonstrably transgressive, which is only possible if there is an assumed awareness of the rule. OK, next case study. My second case study concerns this the Russian alphabet. The most basic and essential medium of verbal display, that without which the word does not become visual object. This is not the place or the time for a full history of the alphabet. I want to fo focus on a particular episode in its and its quite wide cultural ramifications and, and resonances, and this is where there's some overlap with uh, with, with, with another presentation I did yesterday. The Russian alphabet, allegedly the Cyrillic alphabet, which we all, of course, love. Um, there we are. That um, We all love to learn. Um, hasn't always been what it is today. It's changed in three respects. In the repertoire of signs, letters, <laughs> in the appearance of those signs, that is, handwriting, typography, design, and in the conventions or rules for their combination in the representations of words or sounds, that is, spelling, orthography. The most recent significant reform, that which followed shortly after, though it wasn't a direct consequence of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, involved the first and third of these components, the repertoire of letters and the rules for their use. Uh, that's the... Uh, the, the pre-1918 alphabet with, with two or three letters we don't have now, right at the end there, and rules for their use reflecting the, the position of the, what's known as the hard sign. Um, the repertoire of letters, the rules for their use, but not the second of our three features, their appearance. In the narrowly defined alphabetic reform, four letters were abolished as surplus to contemporary requirements. The most prominent feature, I say, of the spelling reform was the abolition of the phonetically redundant hard sign at the end of words, uh, which were ending in non palatalized consonants. This does have some impact on the appearance in that texts with all letters or spellings look archaic or stylized, but it did not involve changing letter display as such. For that, we have to go back another couple of hundred years, more or less to the point at which we broke off the first case study to the alphabet reforms of Peter the Great. The alphabet reforms of Peter the Great did, to some extent, involve the repertoire of letters. But the far more important aspect in today's context relates to the reforms in which the letters were changed, were shaped, the way the alphabet looked, the way that words were displayed. As we'll see, these were not just design choices. They were intended to convey a much larger and deeper nonverbal cultural message. And their broader cultural implications did indeed continue to resonate long after Peter's own time, in some respects, even to the present. So, what were these changes in letter forms, and why should they matter? If we look at a comparison of letter forms in themselves, the differences may seem somewhat marginal. But look at what happens when we translate this up to a full page of print. On the left, uh, a grammar book of the early 1700s, on the right, the first book printed in Peter's newly designed alphabet, a book on geometry published in 1708. To somebody who's learned the modern version, the geometria looks pretty familiar, recognizably similar to what we have now, give or take a few extra letters. But to somebody trained only in the modern alphabet, 
the left-hand page is virtually unreadable. So the overall look is indeed very different. So what? What does that tell us culturally? What was the point of this changed cultural display? First, the two forms of display happen to be based on different graphic models. Neither of them originally, nat originally native to Russia and implying different cultural orientation. The older letter forms were developed from medieval manuscript tradition whose letter forms were initially modeled on Greek, reflecting the fact that Orthodox Slavs accepted Greek Christianity in the Slavonic language. The newer forms were closer to West European Latin traditions, specifically to the Roman or Antiqua rather than Gothic black letter versions of the Latin alphabet with their thinner lines, more regular and rounded shapes. <clears throat> the new alphabet was thus part of and emblematic of the display of Peter's far broader project of westernization, including new look clothes, new look buildings, new look pictures, even new look faces without beards. So that was that. Was that. Uh, was that that Peter the Great reformed the alphabet and thus the display of Russian words became westernized? Not exactly. In fact, it's not even quite accurate to say that Peter reformed the alphabet. If we, if we speak of reform, and many do, we may imply that the old was thereby um, and thenceforth replaced by the new. This was a reform leading to a, a subsequent change as was the case with regard to the 20th century reform mentioned earlier. But this is not what happened. It's not even what Peter attempted to do. This is not actually a reform of the alphabet at all, but an introduction of a new version in specific contexts for specific purposes alongside the old. It was an, in an innovative but alternative form of display, not designed to be the face of written culture as a whole, but designed to mark off one particular section of it, a section with a specific combination of ideological, technological, and to some extent social characteristics. The ideological context was, context was secular. The technological context was predominantly printing. This was not Peter's reformed alphabet, but his Grajdansky Schrift, his civic typeface. The social context was predominantly elite. Peter's civic type was the new look for a new kind of book. Almost all 17th century Russian printed books were directly or indirectly linked to the Christian church. Peter's cultural project was not just westernizing but secular. The new alphabet was not just a sign of modernization to distinguish the new from the old. That would indeed have been reform. The point was to differentiate within the culture of his own time to distinguish the ecclesiastical from the secular, to differentiate the innovative from the traditional. He neither banned church books nor forced them to switch to a new typeface. Coexistence was the point, not replacement. Replacement did eventually happen. Very crudely, we could view the emergence of modern Russian culture as a process through which the type of verbal display on the right uh, gradually infiltrated and competed for and eventually, in effect, monopolized the space previously occupied by the type of display on the left. It was a long, and the one on the right is, is, is a book on typography, 20th century. It was a long and uneven process, not a sudden event. In the first half of the 18th century, quite a lot of non-ecclesiastical texts were, in fact, still printed in the old typeface, often for purely pragmatic reasons, not all printing presses had the new type available. Perhaps more importantly, through most of the 18th century, in villages and towns throughout Russia, children first learnt to read and write using textbooks based on the old alphabet. The civic type and the culture which it signalled was an elite, learned, socially limited indulgence. Towards the end of the century, we see movement. More and more primers started with the civic alphabet, this is a popular 1781 primer, but still coexistence was taken for granted. Children had to learn both alphabets, but the pecking order was shifted. The civic alphabet came first, followed by the traditional alphabet, here now labelled the church alphabet. I said that in the early 18th century, 
Quite a lot of secular printing was still in the old typeface. Crossover in the opposite direction, the printing of ecclesiastical material uh, in the civic typeface encountered more serious barriers. Here, the link between display and cultural message was deeply felt. True religion was not just a set of beliefs and practices. It had a certain look. The traditional mode of display was part of the message, in a sense, iconic. To change the display meant to undermine the culture. To print the Bible, for example, in civic type was close to blasphemy. This is not abstract speculation. In the 1810s and early 1820s, the recently formed Russian Bible Society undertook to translate the Bible from its traditional Church Slavonic into Russian. This involved not just rendering Church Slavonic into Russian as language, but also transposing from the Kirillitsa as the traditional letters were known, even though we now talk about the whole thing as the Cyrillic alphabet, um, into the, the civic alphabet. I can come back to the question of inconsistent alphabet names. It's confusing. The first translation of the Gospels from Church Slavonic into contemporary Russian appeared in 1819, followed by the complete New Testament in 1821. Initially, the Bible Society publications retained both versions in parallel columns. But soon the fig leaf of the traditional alphabet was removed. The translations began to be issued without their Church Slavonic originals and just in the civic type alone, just like any other book. So, instead of looking like the book on the left, here the opening to St. John's Gospel in a traditional Bible, the Bible began to look like the book on the right. That's the opening to St. John's Bosch Gospel in one of the Bible Society editions of the time. Traditionalists were uncomfortable about the whole project. Language and script were not the only points of complaint against the Bible Society, but they were symptomatic and mentioned. Display, what the words of the Bible looked like, was as much a threat to the received order as language. The experiment was stamped on in 1826, not to be revived for a further 50 years. Now the steam has gone out of that particular polemic and the traditional letter forms are retained merely as a design option among many design options. But centuries don't pass without some resonance. These are two CD covers. Uh, on the left, the old letter forms merely suggest some kind of religious content. You can see angels blowing trumpets. You can guess that there's something religious going on. Um, but on the right, the implication is subtly broader. Here we have the same visual motif of a trumpet. You can see the horseman is, is blowing a trumpet. But instead of angels summoning to prayer, we see a picture of folksiness and a caption of national fervor, Rusici, sons of Rus. When a book title, uh, Rus Katore Bola, the Rus that was, is presented in old-style lettering display, we can assume that the book's contents are of the, quote, patriotic variety. The lettering distinguishes not just the religious from the secular, the ancient from the modern, the national from the foreign, the pure from the corrupt, is it a declaration of identity and here ideology. So, returning to my misinterpretation of the title, I'm aware that my examples have been more about the word with a capital W than about display, this is for three reasons. First reason, and the most respectable, is, is my own ignorance. Uh, a very, very great deal of work is being done on many, many aspects of display in Russian culture, but not by me. The second reason is to do with perspective over time. Display is a very recent phenomenon. It's not yet easy either to distinguish current curiosities from long-term structural trends. A third reason which could be proposed is that display is not specific to Russia, but is merely the Russian extension of a global phenomenon. However, though I'm not in the business of prophecy, the case studies here suggest that distinguishing the culture specific, uh, that th distinguishing culture specific features may well emerge. After all, both of my historical case studies stem precisely from moments of cultural reorientation, of engagement with and assimilation of imported modes of verbal display. At one end of the scale, the verbal display in sacred pictures imported as part of Eastern Christianity. At the other end of the scale, the demonstrative disengagement from the near monopoly of sacred verbal display with the import of a new secular <coughs> culture 
which was to be different not only in content but in appearance. The larger cultural dynamics of display are in some ways equivalent. So perhaps we will be able to explore equivalent consequences in a hundred years or so. But that would be stretching the assignment title too far and you've already been patient enough. Thank you.